I'm pleased to moderate this program on using personal stories in online projects, women's stories in the shared history project. As our material that advertised this event described, um, and all of you probably know, historical accounts have neglected women or at least have been dominated by narratives about men. Um, but clearly in recent decades, scholars have uh, devoted much more attention to the role of women in history. So we asked the question about how diaries, letters, and material artifacts uh, representing women and their families are preserved today in archives and museums, and how we can apply those and learn about the significance of gender in history, and from the Leo Beck Institute perspective in German Jewish history, particularly. Um, one way um, is through our shared history project, which ran through uh, 2018 and still exists as a website, which uh, you'll see the, uh, the logo here and also um, we'll post the link uh, in chat. Or, um, <clears throat> so our shared history project um, looked at what Germany was celebrating 1,700 years of Jewish life in German speaking lands. And we wanted to contribute to that project and we did it using 58 artifacts from 50 different archives and museums. The first one being the, the reason we're celebrating 1700 years, the first one being uh, an edict from uh, Emperor Constantine uh, saying that the Jews of Cologne uh, may or must, we, we could debate that, uh, hold public office. The must part would be so that they would pay taxes. <laughs> we went on to pick these 58 objects over 1700 years and we asked scholars to write essays, two essays about each. One was more personal and one was more historical and to present how these objects, what they tell us about the lives of Jews and Germans for 1700 years. Um, this, uh, the, we, today we have three such, uh, three of the scholars who wrote stories about artifacts and you're gonna hear from them shortly. But first, let me give you a few um, housekeeping uh, notions and announcements. Um, the announcements are about a couple of uh, uh, events that are coming up at LBI. We are about to open our new exhibit at the Center for Jewish History uh, here on 16th Street in Manhattan um, about Theresienstadt called The Last Stop Before the Last Stop. This exhibit uh, opening, the official opening will be on April 12th. Um, with remarks by Holocaust survivor Susanna Eustman. And also uh, we'll have a virtual lecture about the exhibit and Theresa Stott by Anna Hajkova on April 26th. You can find these in um, our website uh, and uh, the link will be put into chat right now for our programs. Um, but also the exhibit will be up for the better part of the rest of the year. So please come to the Center for Jewish History and um, see it. Um, a second event that I wanted to point out is Identity Between Worlds, Hungarian Jewish Cultural Achievement Before and After the Holocaust, featuring journalist Katie Martin, social historian Andras Kerner, and moderated by Rafael Pastor. Uh, a very interesting discussion about the complex role of national identity in the lives and work of Hungarian Jews. So uh, please watch uh, our website for programs, uh, get on our mailing list, and the same uh, for the Fordham Center for Jewish Studies, which does a, has a remarkable list of programs as well. Um, what I'm gonna do now is introduce our participants. Um, before going to the three people in our panel, I also wanna thank um, LBI's Associate Director of Public History, Dr. Magda Robel, who helped set up this program which was originally slated to be presented at the Association for Jewish Studies. Uh, Magda, again, uh, helped create this program and was also integral to the success of the Shared History Project. Our three participants who are going to share their experiences with uh, three different objects begins with Professor Rebecca Rovit, who is Associate Professor of Theater and Dance at the University of Kansas. Dr. Rovit's expertise on the cultural heritage of the Holocaust. Um, is evident in, in her microhistory, the Jewish Kulturbund Theater Company in Nazi Berlin. Um, for the Shared History Project, she wrote about the biography of Gerda Lichtenstein. 
Um, I just realized that these are not in the order that they're going to present, so I apologize about that. I think we're in alphabetical order, but um, the presentation will actually be the reverse of that, I believe. Um, professor Lisa Silverman is Associate Professor of History and Jewish Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Dr. Silverman specializes in modern German and Austrian Jewish cultural history with a focus on visual culture, gender, and anti-Semitism. She wrote about the painting Adele Block Bauer by Gustav Klimt. Um, and you'll actually hear first from Professor Magda Tedder, who's Professor of History in Schwidler Chair of Judaic Studies at Fordham University. She's a scholar of early modern history, specializing in Jewish history, Jewish Christian relations, cultural legacy, legal and social history, as well as the history of transmission of historical knowledge in the pre-modern and modern periods. For the Shared History Project, she wrote about women as co-victims in the blood libel trials in the 15th century. So each of our panelists will briefly talk about their objects and then we'll come back and have a discussion and we welcome your questions, which we will get to uh, later in the program, if you'll put them in the Q&A uh, on the Zoom. Thank you very much. And uh, Magda, I believe you're starting. Uh, thank you so much for, for having me here, included here. I am not a scholar of women, but I have worked on this um, trial of the Jews in uh, the northern Italian city, now in Italy, Trento, but it was at the uh sort of boundary of the holy roman empire and it was a bilingual german uh, and italian city with a small jewish community in 1475 um uh, after a child disappeared a boy uh, named simon disappeared and then his body was found uh, under a jewish home uh washed under the canal near a jewish home uh, Jews of Trento were accused of, uh, of killing him. Actually, uh, today is what the 25th. Um, uh, so on the 24th of uh, April, March uh, 1475, Simon uh, disappeared and Jews were uh, then arrested a few, a few days later on March 26th, uh, if, I, if, if memory serves. Um, so, um, the trial records uh, that are at the Yeshiva University um, Museum and this, at the Center for Jewish History are a German translation of another of protocols that had been written in, in Latin. What is um, remarkable about this trial is that it is one of the best known, partly because it was um, ex ex extraordinarily well documented, and it was documented. Uh, by both archival records and as a trial that took place in 1475, just a few years after the invention of the printing press, also through the new print media. And um, the, uh, the trial records and the print media really are, uh, though massive in terms of the amount of, uh, of material, they only present one side. That is a side, the accusatory side, the side of Bishop Hinderbach of uh, of Trento, who had an agenda to create a shrine uh, devoted to the worship of the little Simon. So he used both the archival records and the trial and then the print technology to promote the cult, a newly emerging cult of Simon. So maybe the next, um, the next uh, slide now to show you one example of uh, the type of uh, 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 works that were, or, or the type of material that was printed. Um, this is the first time that the accusation that Jews killed Christian children is visualized. We have very little, if any, uh, iconographic remnants of these accusations that emerge um, first in the 12th century and then um, are uh, ramped up in the 13th century with the addition of the blood motif. That is that Jews kill Christian children to also obtain the blood, which you can see here on this on this painting. But typically in these accusations, um, women are not present. It's always the Jew, the Jewish man, the Jewish uh, men plural, and the Jewish a Jewish man in a singular who is the perpetrator. Here, for the first time, we actually see a woman. Uh, shown and this is the a, a scene as imagined by Bishop Hinderbach of the 
so-called martyrdom of Simon, and was printed in 1475, soon after the, the trial uh, happened. Um, so you can see the G Jews who are named on this and a woman uh, on, this, uh, on this image, Brunetta, um, uh, who was the wife of, uh, of the Jew Samuel on this, on this image. This is very unusual. Brunetta, and this is what the uh, personal essay is about, is visible in the iconography here, but she's actually erased from the archival record. So the, um, the trial records that are at the Shiva Museum actually include the records of the trial, not of the men, but also of all the women who were uh, arrested and put in a house arrest in Trento. But Brunetta's records are lost. Where Brunetta is remembered, Brunetta is remembered in this iconography and is remembered in a, a Jewish kina, a Jewish poem commemorating the martyrdom of Jews in, in Trento. And she is remembered as someone who did not confess and who did not convert. Many of the Jews are under torture, either confessed with time, uh, numerous torture, or uh, converted to Christianity um, to ease their execution. They were all executed by uh, uh, either by burning if they didn't convert or by decapitation if they converted. Uh, Brunetta did not. Why are her records lost? I would suggest that her records contain something damaging to the Bishop of Trento who wanted to create this uh, site of, uh, of veneration for this little boy, Simon. And it was the records that he preserved and compiled that we now have, um, but that her testimony and her refusal to confess and perhaps adding some more must have um, contradicted the goal, which is why the records either have been lost or I would argue have been disappeared. Um, so, um, uh, so what we what we have again is this fa fascinating case where a historical woman is both erased and brought to the fore uh, by the same uh, actor, by the same bishop, uh, showing her as an evil uh, actor in the drama of the of the supposed martyrdom of Simon, but yet erasing her from the record of the trial itself, and her memory only is preserved in, um, in a Jewish uh, poem, uh, which praises her as a martyr. So I'll just stop here. Okay. Um, so now we travel uh, a few centuries later. Um, so this object, uh, the painting, Portrait of Adele Bloch Bauer, actually um, encompasses the stories of two Jewish women that I'll just talk about briefly here. So the future looked pretty good for Viennese Jews and Jewish women in particular at the start of the 20th century. Anti-Semitism existed for sure, but it didn't stop couples like Ferdinand and Adele Blochbauer from becoming successful members of elite Viennese society. And that's a status that would have been unthinkable for Jews de just decades earlier. Gustav Klimt's painting of Adele actually represents the pinnacle of Jews' participation and influence in culture, art, and society. And the Blochbauer's choice of Klimt, a painter as an avant-garde painter, um, whose career really depended on clients like them, their choice of him was a testament to Jews' cooperation with non-Jews in shaping Austrian culture, despite anti-Semitism that sort of now overshadows the history of what happened to this painting. So how did this portrait of Adele Blochbauer one, which was later renamed The Woman in Gold to obscure its Jewish origins, and some of you may be familiar with the film about it by the same name. So how did this painting come to represent such a vital part of Austrian and Jewish cultural history? And to understand it, um, it needs to be contextualized 
in a number of different fields in the history of Jewish art patronage in Vienna, um, in, the, in terms of the lives and representation of Jewish women and Jews dispossession, expulsion and murder in the Holocaust. So decades after Austrian Jews emancipation, which happened only in 1867, Art patronage was one way that wealthy Jews could craft new self-identifications as Austrians without completely abandoning their Jewish distinctiveness. To immerse themselves in society in a meaningful way, a number of Jews supported modern progressive artists, designers, architects, musicians, all kinds of people, many of whom were often shunned by mainstream Viennese society. So supporting innovations was one way that Jews maintained distinctiveness. Adele was born in Vienna on August 9th, 1881, and she was the youngest daughter of seven children. Her father Moritz was a prominent banker and president of a railway company. And she was denied the possibility to study. She was unhappy at home. And so she married industrialist Ferdinand Bloch, who was 17 years her senior in 1899, so pretty early. And um, second slide, please. Adele's niece, Maria Altman, recalled Adele, her aunt, as constantly seeking mental stimulation. And also, Maria described her as sickly and suffering and smoking like a chimney. She was apparently both elegant and arrogant. And um, Ferdinand asked Klim to paint Adele's portrait, and this portrait here uh, was begun in 1903 and finished in 1907. And so you'll see here Adele sits on a golden throne. She's a modern icon, and this painting in particular, like a lot of Klim's other portraits, is unusual for its prominent starry background. So the background is really coming to the fore, which is unusual for a portrait. And here it complements her rich golden robe, She's surrounded by erotic symbols like triangles, eggs, and eyes. And in addition to this and another portrait of Adele, um, the Blockbauers also purchased four landscapes and numerous drawings from Klimt, as well as a host of other artworks and objects by others. Um, and Adele actually erected something of a shrine to Klimt in their new palace in Vienna, which is the center of the city. Um, and she included not only his paintings, but also a photo of the artist. And some have speculated whether she had a more intimate relationship with Klimt, although that has never been proven. So what's important though, is that Adele mixed public and private life via a salon in her home, featuring notable luminaries such as writer Arthur Schnitzler and composer Richard Strauss. So salons were organized by Jewish women, often by Jewish women in Vienna and Berlin around that time. And they were uh, informal social gatherings in which Jewish women nevertheless played significant roles in developing European literature, art, and politics. So salon hosts like Adele would curate ideological and intellectual discussions or music and theater performances. Um, they might focus on social reform and so this portrait is a testament and symbolizes how some Jewish women who were typically marginalized from these institutions of social power actively interpreted and shaped and fostered Viennese culture, you know, more than just. So Klimt's unabashed portrayal of Adele's beauty and seductive power plays on gendered stereotypes about Jewish women also as seductive and exotic and it references men's ambivalent desire for Jewish women. And by that, I mean, some found it beautiful while, while some anti-Semitic critics backhandedly complimented Klimt's ability to hide Adele's ugliness. So Adele died in 1925, eight years before Hitler came to power. And when the Nazis annexed Austria in 1938, Ferdinand was forced to flee and leave everything behind. And he died in 1945, whereby um, Maria, I'm sorry, whereby Adele had died in um, already earlier and she had actually bequested um, that Ferdinand leave the paintings after his death to the museum, but she could not have foreseen obviously what happened. Um, so in any case, the painting remained in Austria until a new restitution law in 1998 allowed Maria Altman to renew her efforts and this painting meant a lot to her 
particularly because Ferdinand had gifted her Maria's necklace that you see there um, and earrings. So her case went all the way to the US Supreme Court actually, which ruled, ruled that she had the right to pursue the claim. And in 2006, the portrait was finally restituted to her. And as a testament to its lasting force as a powerful symbol of shared Austrian and Jewish cultural history, Ronald Lauder purchased it from, purchased it from her for $135 million, which was at that time a record price. Um, and it's now in his Neue Gallery for German and Austrian art in New York. And I will just stop there. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, my object or art artifact that I uh, was uh, first writing about and commissioned to write about is this flute. Uh, this flute belonged to Alfred Liechtenstein, and uh, Liechtenstein was a, a, a very well-known flautist uh, in Europe and uh, also in the Middle East. Uh, already uh, by the 1920s when he was dubbed the man with the golden flute because uh, in the early 20s he had uh, got as a royal gift from the king of Greece uh, a rather uh, ornate flute of 18 karat gold decorated with diamonds and rubies and sapphires uh, and that particular flute uh, was one he uh, took along with him when uh, he had to emigrate. As you can see uh, on the slide, uh, I have his um, identification uh, in Nazi Germany from 1939, uh, where um, you know he had to more or less report uh, who he was. Uh, in any case, uh, this was uh, an object uh, that uh, I was writing about, and the uh, Leo Beck Institute has really a virtual trove of documents in many languages that actually mark the Golden Flute's departure from Germany and its emigration route of uh, Alfred Liechtenstein, who transported this very important instrument uh, and source of livelihood and fame across three continents uh, after Hitler's uh, cultural policy suspended uh, any uh, means for him to perform in Germany, uh, in Berlin. Uh, but it wasn't only the golden flute and the alloy flute you see here, several boxes of flutes uh, that Alfred transported from Berlin to London. And then in 1940, uh, on a lengthy sea voyage uh, to Portugal and on to Buenos Aires, Argentina, and then the US in 1954. But in fact, Alfred's wife, Gerta Lichtenstein, and three-year-old daughter, Sylvia, uh, made up Alfred's precious cargo. Uh, so my personal essay was to investigate who was Gerda Marie Lichtenstein, the Schuler, second slide, please, uh, who would become in the Third Reich uh, on paperwork, such as uh, what you see here from uh, 1939, March, Gerta Sara Lichtenstein, and who then would Americanize her name and uh, eventually establish her independence from dictatorship and marriage in New York uh, later on in the 50s. Uh, this uh, was a woman who had to learn how to adapt, to be resourceful, to learn other languages, uh, even in Argentina, she had to, in addition to taking care of her daughter, also uh, try to earn some extra money because Alfred could not always get uh, concert uh, engagements. And uh, so in effect, uh, she began to reinvent herself. Uh, and when she came to the US, she changed her name yet again to Grace Lindsay, uh, sought a separation, eventually divorced from Alfred, uh, and in effect uh, sought to recuperate herself as well as uh, get reparations from the German government for her for forced 
displacement, loss of belongings and home uh, and eventually uh, get some kind of independence and occupation uh, as an x-ray technician and radiation therapist uh, and uh, eventually uh, in a sense separate herself also, and this is reflected even in the archival documents at the LVI, actually separate herself in terms of how she's situated in the archive. Uh, so uh, interestingly enough, uh, the uh, materials for Gerta Lichtenstein are uh, understandably associated with her husband, Alfred's, uh, but when she uh, begins in a sense a new life and uh, gives texture, if you will, in, uh, to her uh, identity, uh, expanding into Graceland. The um, even the archival holdings are uh, in in a way organized differently under uh, her own name. Uh, she was a, a writer. She was a professional whistler, uh, and uh, actually, as I said before. Uh, did a lot more than just caring for her uh, daughter. So um, this has been quite fascinating. And as we continue our discussion shortly, uh, I think we're going to want to ask, how does gender affect the ways that we retrieve history uh, as historians and historiographers and how we narrate it in addition to what my colleagues have suggested uh, the uh, sort of re-embodiment of women's stories and women's bodies uh, that we might uh, make more visible in, uh, in uh, giving uh, credence to uh, some of those women uh, behind or next to or even in front of those men. Uh, and I think I'll stop there so we have plenty of time. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Thanks to each of you for these fantastic stories, which I know you got very close to in your time of looking at the objects and then writing the essays. And I encourage people to read their work. And um, yes, my, my first question has a lot to do with um, what Rebecca said at the end. And, and I, I, I liked the, the, I was trying to find the word and I think re-embodiment is really important because in each of these examples, in, in, in Magda's example, you know, the, the, in the painting, but nowhere else, maybe in the poem, in, in Lisa's example, yes, you know, embodied in this painting, but the real person, you know, uh, obscured and, and, and nowhere near the image of the painting. And then here we're staring at this flute and there's a whole story of a woman behind the flute, but the flute carries the label of the man. Um, so it, it would it I would love your comments both on on that fact the, the re-embodiment, but also um, I'm so important from my perspective is LBI being an archive, how we are archives, the the physical um, evidence of individuals in history, what role we can play in that um, re-embodiment if we can continue to use that word. So um, uh, I don't. Uh, it, hopefully we won't talk over each other, just, just uh, chime in and we'll have a conversation about that question. Uh, someone should feel free to speak first. Um, I can, I'll, I'll start with um, the portrait. You know, it, it is really interesting when you think of it in terms of the embodiment of, of Adele as a Jewish woman. And some something that I think is really interesting that art historians are now doing is not necessarily seeing this portrait is as a portrait by a man gazing on a woman and her not having anything to do with it, but rather understanding that perhaps she was involved in creating it, depending on what kind of relationship she had with Klimt, and also having her depiction perhaps be a play on how people understood Jewish women. Perhaps she was able to sort of help shape her own image in that sense, wanting that kind of thing. We don't, I don't really know. Um, and, and I haven't done the research, but I think that's a really interesting angle that art historians are taking now on it. Mm -hmm. um, 
I, I saw a question that is related uh, to Alfred Lichtenstein and of course um, being able to um, access these uh, materials online during an, a pandemic. Uh, one, one can really uh, play with uh, the idea of uh, embodiment and how we as historians are uh, sort of sequestered even in these Zoom boxes as, as we try to um, uh, tell those stories and then go the next step through analysis, uh, such as my colleagues have done. Uh, the uh, interesting question of what happened to Alfred Lichtenstein's um, music career, uh, it was stop and go in Buenos Aires for a while. He actually had to perform on ships uh, as did his wife, incidentally, who learned Spanish probably quicker uh, than her husband did. Uh, but that aside, uh, it took 14 years for the Liechtensteins to sail back to New York. And all the mean, in the meantime, uh, Alfred was uh, trying to engage agents and uh, old um, acquaintances and people in the music uh, career uh, so that when he returned to New York, he could uh, kind of get a, a new start. And really, uh, it was a bit of a new start, something that uh, he has written about in the 50s in letters, where even, as he says, in spite of the golden flute and the advertising and my experiences, uh, I must, quote, begin entirely anew. That being said, uh, he was able to, uh, you know, make uh, engagements and play with pianists and finally travel back to Berlin in the 70s and play again in some of the same venues <laughs> that he had played in decades before. Uh, but uh, it was not a smooth uh, ride in terms of uh, finding that. So I want to go back to the archival question uh, about what archives do. And I think uh, archives are crucial in, in uh, creating a much more textured understanding of history. Because in this case, in the case of Brunetta, um, she is uh, erased from the records. But uh, the records that the Yeshiva University Museum has, uh, has trial records of the women. The Vatican archives have trial records of the of the uh, of the Jews, but only of the men. So different records contain different stories and different ways. And historians and archival records help us understand the uh, these stories much more in a much more precise way. Um, the, there is uh, there is the public facing right, like the painting that Lisa was talking about material or that uh, pamphlet that I showed you. And then there is a different story that archives can, can, uh, can help us understand better. Um, but I also would caution about the sort of, um, um, that the archives really need to be mediated. That is archival records have only value if they are used. Uh, if they are accessed. So what LBI is doing by digitizing it is really incredibly important. Um, and they are also, they need to be interpreted. That is, they cannot be taken at face value. And the, uh, the case of the trial of Jews in Trent is, is a prime example of how uncritical use of archives and archival sources can be dangerous because uh, these trial records, as they are preserved, only present one side of the story, a story of the accusers, the way they wanted us to understand this trial. Uh, without historians who might be uh, able to see different parts of it or familiar with different, uh, different connected or, uh, or, or other types of documents, um, that kind of source just unmediated might, might be uh, dangerous. So I think the, um, the Church History Project does an excellent job by bringing these archival materials, these museum materials to fore, but interpreted by experts 
in uh, clear language and uh, ways that can be accessed um, by the broader public who may not have the tools, whether linguistic tools or paleographical tools or other tools to uh, process this uh, massive material that the archives have. So access to the archives, uh, use of the archives, otherwise it's just paper. Um, it is uh, an interpretation by experts, I think, is very, very key in, in the way. And I think, that as, as I said, what, what the LBI does and also what the Short History Project kind of embodies this, this sort of um, uh, best practices of what, what archives can do and, uh, and how they can be accessed and then used and presented to the public through this translation into um, a, 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 a language, that, a vernacular, rather than the sort of scholarly uh, historical work. And, and if I might uh, just add to that, uh, absolutely. Uh, one of the very exciting things for me uh, on this project was having the choice to write an additional personal essay, uh, because we three and others of us could have chosen so many other angles uh, and we, uh, we chose uh, some of those invisible bodies, of course, invisible only because of what the dominant narratives and the dominant, uh, in my case, perhaps a breadwinner and uh, famous, uh, not just a professional whistler, but, uh, but a flautist, uh, what they did. And we chose to make visible uh, these alternate or alternative stories uh, in order to suggest uh, exactly what, what Magda, you've just said, that, uh, that there's a plurality uh, and a multi-texture of, uh, of, uh, of stories connected to our artifacts and certainly to the men uh, in, in these. Uh, and uh, in, in a way, it allows us as interpreters and, and those of you who uh, enjoy even looking at family history or legacy or what have you, uh, the ability to look at multiple kinds of archival materials uh, to uh, you know, go to the next step, which is always interpretation and allows, uh, I mean, we, we can't park our biases or our interests uh, just uh, by the wayside, but we can be objective enough to triangulate and look from this angle or that angle uh, and ask questions. Uh, and the Leo Beck uh, Shared History Project, I think, is, is leading us in that direction. It's very, uh, uh, very exciting, actually. Yeah, I, I thank you both for those comments about the Shared History Project. And, and we're so glad it was a success, but it also helped us think about our role. I mean, it's clear that with digitization, um, there is this opportunity, but almost as, as Monta says, an obligation for us to mediate the materials because uh, it used to be that uh, only scholars and maybe a few individuals who were doing genealogical work would come and physically look at our materials. With them being online, anybody can get there, but not anybody can make sense out of those materials. So that's the combination of the opportunity slash obligation. And um, I'm really pleased that we didn't skip past the scholars that we used scholars joined us in selecting the objects uh, and then uh, also this idea of writing two essays so that you know there could be something that could be a little bit more personal a little bit more historical or however we, we chose to divide them um, worked out wonderfully so I appreciate those those uh, shout outs to how it worked out can I just add a, a, a comment about women in the archives is that archives are really products of power and women were often not those responsible and able to exercise that power. So their voices and materials about them might be not visible. And sometimes it might be like in my trial records that you have to read between the lines. Sometimes there might be uh, actual materials related to women's histories, but they are classified like the, for instance, the flute under the men's names. So it takes um, some 
kind of forensic work to excavate the women's voices and materials that are there, but, um, but they may not be visible because of the sort of history of the archive. So another thing to think about is how an archive is uh, created and who's, who is behind it to, um, to be able to understand what might be there and what may not be visible, but might still be there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think that's key. Um, we're, we're, we, maybe I should have asked earlier, but this was flowing so well, but you know, we're almost taking for granted the fact that we want women's stories, and yet that wasn't always the case. I'm wondering if you're, you know, 18 year old first year students are taking for granted that, that, that there are women's stories to be told. We're talking about the, how technology helped to bring those to fore. And then even with technology, as Magda points out, it also means reading between the lines and doing forensic work. But um, there may be younger people watching us right now. And, and, and so what are the factors? The archives allowed that, but what is it over the last few decades that have, uh, what factors in our own contemporary history have led us to uh, bringing women's stories uh, if not on a par with men's stories, but bringing women's stories alive and as a part of history. I think uh, certainly Magda began to talk about uh, power, uh, access to power, uh, whose stories should be told and whose mm -hmm. have been erased, et cetera. Um, and I think uh, obviously uh, you, you need to look at second and third wave uh, feminism uh, to, uh, understand better, and this does affect our 19-year-old, 20-year-old students, um, if, if you will, uh, look at uh, what some people have called the ethics of care. It's not just <laughs> caregiving, it's giving care to uh, make visible the women's lives, their relationships to power, including uh, to men or in dictatorships or what have you. Uh, and that uh, really already in what the 1970s, uh, there were uh, feminists who were saying, we have an ethical imperative for feminist history to um, make it clear that there is interdependency among human beings and uh, women, uh, and, and their stories and their agency and their everyday lives, this Alltagsgeschichte uh, is, is, is extremely important uh, also for their connections to a greater cultural sociopolitical causes and forces. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, um, and I'll just add to that too, it's um, important not just for, uh, in addition as a feminist history and a feminist approach, but you know, Jewish history for such a long time just mimicked exactly what regular other history was doing, a broader history, which was the history of men, et cetera. And it's really uh, taking women's stories into consideration, even when it's really their absence that you can, that you highlight when you are in the archive and you see that there's things missing to tell about their lives. Um, it really helps you reshape how we see Jewish history, right? It's not just looking at women per se, and it's not just looking at gender, but it's looking at how we understand Judaism um, and Jewish lives in the past. And I, I will also add that the, uh, you know, the political and cultural transformation that led to some of these questions, feminism and stuff, also brought more uh, women scholars. So the diversity in academia, and I mean it in broad sense, we're here talking about women, but about other voices in the academic world also means that we begin to see in sources that we know and have known forever or often have, have not been um, you know, hidden in the archives, but are but we're beginning to see different things because we come from different uh, places. So what, oh, and a source that may not have seen women because it was, uh, because men may have been uh, asking different questions, uh, their histories may have been asking different questions. Uh, women scholars 
began to see different things in and 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 see new uh, material in the old and then also discover then lead the discover to new materials as well uh, and again and i think that applies to any other voices but i think that is a crucial thing of um of having that re representation in the academic world so the um uh, students today are not surprised that they have a, a woman professor, but some decades ago, this would have been um, a different story. So I think that's also part of the of Right, right. And it, it's, it's a, that's a great point, but also back to whether the stories were in there. In some ways, we're saying that they weren't in there, or were we looking? And so these, uh, you know, not only women scholars, but of course, predominantly women scholars started to look for these stories. And found them, yeah. re-embodied them, as, as we were saying. Uh, a, a different perspective of what may be obscured is we, we do have a question um, about uh, the Holocaust. Uh, considering the importance of embodying artifacts, uh, how do you think the destruction of personal items of Jews from the Holocaust skews the perception of Jewish history today? I'd love to hear your comments, but also just to say, uh, for people want to know, uh, why, uh, if we're doing an object a week, do we do 58 objects? Uh, our, our selection group really struggled with what to do with the Holocaust. Uh, if we're covering 1700 years, do we cover the Holocaust in one item? And we decided uh, the, the week chronologically when we hit the Holocaust, which ironically was the week of the same week of uh, Kristallnacht, um, we did seven objects, one, one each day to kind of add uh, emphasis. But um, what are how would any of you want to respond to this notion of uh, the destruction of personal items uh, from the Holocaust? Um, well, I'll just say, you know, it, it's true, like, like, as, as with any item or piece of history, Jewish history, always is going to have that um, danger of being overshadowed by the Holocaust. It's something people are aware of. But I think that objects in particular, really, when properly contextualized, really allow for a much broader in, understanding of what that object meant to the, the person who lost it. Um, and that in, a, in and of itself doesn't necessarily reflect anti-Semitism, right? Anti-Semitism plays a role into why that object is there. But if you dig deeper and contextualize it according to Jewish lives at the time, you can sort of get beyond anti-Semitism, not ignore it, not ignore the anti-Semitism they faced, such as, you know, the Bloch Bowers were certainly aware of anti-Semitism, but it didn't necessarily shape every aspect of their lives and certainly only to a certain degree shaped that painting, right? And then talking about uh, what happened to the painting afterwards, obviously, is another story and its value, et cetera. Um, but there's much more there that an object can give. I want to comment not necessarily about the destruction of objects in the Holocaust, but just the questions of uh, of preservation and what's destroyed and what's how we understand history. So we write history based on what's preserved. Uh, but we also that that goes back to that question about who is included in what's preserved. And that is um, not just that documents or objects are created, they are created all the time but what and who decides what's preserved. And so much more is destroyed than it's preserved. So I think we have to be aware of that. And therefore, you know, maybe the letters of the mother may not have been preserved by the business uh, correspondence of the father may have been preserved in that, uh, in that kind of way. What do the families choose to um, hide uh, and not preserve and not give to the archives with family papers and what might be therefore uh, eluded. So I think, um, I think when writing, when even using archives, you have to be always aware, not just of the presence, but also as Lisa was also saying about what's absent and why it might be absent. And, and it doesn't have to be an act of destruction like Nazi uh, destruction of property, but it can also be just something that is not seen value. And we destroy documents every day. Uh, we, you know, so, so that is something to also keep in mind. 
I just right, wanted right. to bring up one more thing that uh, sort of ties together some of uh, what came out of our personal essays and is uh, 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 connected to this idea of preservation, uh, especially like in my uh, stories case, uh, there were actually multiple flutes. The golden flute did make this journey uh, and it was eventually the daughter, Sylvia, eventually uh, was able to auction it off at Christie's in New York in the 80s. Uh, so uh, the Leo Beck didn't get that flute. But uh, but I think when you get something like a flute or a, a painting that uh, that travels around and is passed on generationally, um, that that this is this is uh, also quite interesting in terms of even in Brunetta's case, uh, the the intergenerational aspects of our um, of our stories and of some of the objects that either make it out of emigration. I mean, we're all looking right now at forced emigration out of Ukraine, uh, where women and children are, are are taking whatever they can uh, to preserve, and who knows if you know they'll get something else uh, that that intergenerational travel after destruction or um, over centuries of uh, you know, the plight uh, of, of the Jews, for example, uh, extends to, uh, to the, the spaces of memory, I think, uh, and uh, obviously inherited trauma as well. Uh, and, and so again, the absent, I really like uh, what Lisa, what you said, about the absence and our job sometimes as historians to uh, to to seek to make present what is absent, which of uh, which is which is part of that, and it extends to um, to belongings and uh, artifacts that don't make it. Yeah, I, I'd like to add something about the Holocaust. Uh, obviously, so much was lost in the Holocaust, but so much of the efforts of uh, not just the Leo Beck Institute, which covers centuries of artifacts, but uh, Holocaust museums and, and archives. There, there's a lot that was lost, but there's a lot that's been um, saved. And um, even if you want to count it, the, the artwork that was saved by the Nazis who had planned to make a museum about the, the you know, Jews after they were gone. So there, there are things out there um, and uh, I, I think that they're they're highly valued by uh, by all of us as well as the historians who write about them. Um, Magda, I don't know if you want to re reply or I mean, this is there's an interesting comment here about um, archives strive to be neutral resources. The documents have to be contextualized and interpreted by scholars and historians. Um, however, historiographies are always children of their time. So uh, what someone finds in an archive a century ago or, or even 15 years ago, how it might differ from what we find today, what, what the individual sees in it today. That's right. No, I think all history and what we see is, uh, is very much we're products of our times, but we're also products of very specific events that affect the way we see um, uh, the past. So it could be big movements like the women's movement, but it could also be very specific um, events that make us see different things in the same materials that even we scholars who may have read them before begin to see uh, new. So, so there is definitely, I mean, the history is always written by and informed by the present. Um, uh, so uh, even in the antiquarian kind of sense of not interpreting, but just sort of this, describing what you retrieve is also what you choose to retrieve as facts or as, uh, as artifacts or as documents are informed by what you deem at one moment as important and valuable. So. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, something that I sometimes I think about and it might be interesting to think about is what archival research and how it's disseminated might look like in the future and what would be the wish list. And I, when I think about it, I think, okay, right now we have a page, even if it's an ebook and we have a footnote, what if you could just link right to that source and maybe even 
have comments on it or not comments on it, or you know, um, you could really see how it's been interpreted and shaped in a whole new way. So you could see it, how it was used by the historian in the book, and then you could see it on its own to read for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, with that contextualization, it's kind of uh, exciting to think about the possibilities that one could have for archival yeah. work. That's, that's but, a great point. If I could, uh, I saw Magda wanted to speak, but I just want to say uh, uh, about that. Uh, one is I've often toyed with some crowdsourcing notions about what we're doing, that what we could build from that. But but also uh, the diving in, our, my colleague Karen Franklin pointed out that there's uh, material on, on uh, the Blockbauer family in the collection of LBI. And the, the, the things that we, the objects we picked and the essays that, that you all wrote are, are really just the tip of the iceberg. And the hope is it really does invite people now in an informed way to dive in and and go and see um, as best as you can see digitally you know originals or read a finding aid that real that, that that describes it and to to uh, make public people their own researchers obviously it's not going to replace the the professional historian but um, to, to get beyond I mean it's a beautiful painting but what what to get to the story like that that that, that uh, Lisa told us earlier in this. And that's exactly what I wanted to say is what is amazing and what is really uh, most valuable, I think, about the uh, shared history project is that it engages both uh, objects and archival materials. That is, we live in the material world. We interact with objects far more than we interact with texts. Um, we um, uh, or we even produce texts. Uh, so I think I, I think the the marriage of both and 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 presenting it to the public as uh, interdependence of objects and archive is really really one of the you know successes of this project. And I think it, it highlights the importance of uh, historians have often been sort of looking at the at the text without realizing that these texts were produced in the material world. And then the objects are also part of a of a world that is uh, that that can be illuminated uh, by what's hidden in the archives. So uh, I think there is this sort of interdependence of both the material world and the archival resources. And ourselves, as you pointed out early, because we are uh, the mediators and uh, the interpreters or translators, or uh, so too are uh, other. Uh, historians or, or lay people who are just looking for uh, something uh, that connects perhaps to uh, a scholarly uh, question or a family history. Um, I mean, our own the, embodiment into yeah. the archive. Uh, yeah, I, I, again, I love this embodiment notion and, and I also love that that uh, Bob used the word illuminated, which, you know, obviously, for time for a long time now we've had illuminated manuscripts but illumination is is also a, a less uh, visual thing it, it really is what uh, you guys do when you go into the archives you're illuminating these stories um, we do have a question uh, about the role of archival photos and videos um, uh, given the rise of fake news you know uh, so how how do we use uh, the power that all of you are talking about of the uh, of of the original of of the archive that um, hopefully people recognize that it's real and not fake. Um, but how do we uh, keep uh, the truth, the facts, uh, up there given um, fake news and the way that technology can even produce fake artifacts? Well, my uh, artifacts, the two um, that the uh, shared history project that are actually artifacts, original artifacts of fake news, of fake stories, of lies that were embedded in um, beautifully illuminated manuscripts and in making them authoritative and, and uh, believable because they came out of authoritative offices. So in this, not that's 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 what I mean that the, that the the records have to be mediated because uh, not not everything that's found in the archives 
is a product of tr is true, mm -hmm. but it's a product of a historical moment that we have to explain why such even fake are, uh, uh, stories become part of an archival record of that. So both the image is a, a, a lie and a fake story and the, the court records that are inscribed and testified by a notary that they are authentic are also records of a lie. So that's, that's what I meant by uh, the mediation is important because uh, because if it's not, it might be uh, misinterpreted and, and people have taken these archival records of Jews being convicted of killing Christian children as evidence that in fact Jews were guilty of the, of those uh, of those uh, mm -hmm. crimes. So. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really good question, uh, given that we no longer think of, you know, the the grand dominant historical arc of history. Uh, we look towards plurality of stories and therefore uh, as we do that to recuperate stories and bodies and voices uh, that have been unheard, we do run the risk of alternate and, and fake uh, histories on the rise. Uh, and again, we, we're already seeing some of this in the uh, Ukrainian-Russian conflict where some of these deep fakes are shown or, you know, it, it, is, it is a really good question. Uh, I don't think we're going back to the, you know, grand récit of uh, history. I think there's been a lot of resistance in the last decades when we do history. So um, there isn't, I think there's an ethical Im imperative on the part of historians and archivists uh, to really do the work, uh, to, to, to really, uh, you know, as we piece things together, be as, as tr truthful as possible and not try to, you know, make uh, something out of it. I mean, I'm thinking about um, at least uh, Gerta Lichtenstein and how she's just a kind, you know, she's, not a revolutionary, she wasn't, at least uh, in what I've gleaned so far. Uh, and it's precisely getting some of these everyday ordinary lives and not pumping them up to say, look, this is a model of, uh, you know, the kind of activist woman that we like. No, she was, she was a woman like many of us who was trying to survive, keep her family intact and deal with unbelievable um, challenges to her to her life and livelihood uh, was a very good question. Although, I mean, we, we were saying before that we are, you know, we look at, art, at, at artifacts and archives as a product of our times. That also means it's also a product of our perception. I mean, my background is not history, it's psychology. And, you know, the back of your eyeball, you're, you're, what you're looking at right now is upside down and blurry and your brain is turning it into a coherent picture. So. Um, I agree about the ethical imp imperative, but being truthful is also uh, relative. It's, it is essentially subjective in, in the way subjective. the human's mm -hmm. perception and cognition works. And, and another element too, and not just to be truthful, but to be critical, you know, to really keep in mind what it means to approach um, a, a document or an object with a, a critical under, you know, a, a mind to really understand what it means is tying into what Magda said about it could be fake, but also, you know, um, for example, with, with Holocaust history, um, if you have um, a, a memoir or something written by a, a survivor, you know, it's the, the, the impulse to just take that person at their word because of course they experienced it. So who could be a better eyewitness? Of course, they're an eyewitness, but as historians, we have to take a step back and contextualize that eyewitness testimony critically, even if it seems um, wrong or um, not nice to, to uh, or, or if it seems like you're um, sort of denigrating the memory, right? You have to take a different role and a different tack. And I think that's important to keep in mind, particularly for Jewish history after the Holocaust. We, we just got a great question that I'm going to use to to close, but it will take a little time to answer it. I'd like each of the three of you to think of this and answer this 
What piece of advice could you offer to the younger generations of how to best preserve and embody our accurate and formative history? So you're training the historians of tomorrow. What advice do you have for them? I would say go to the source. <laughs> don't, don't rely on other people's interpretations of sources. Don't be shy about going and demanding to see the actual primary source on which history is being based. Because um, if you can approach it with a critical eye, you might get a completely different understanding than somebody else as a historian. I'm actually worried about what history will be, how history will be written. And I won't be, I won't be around to know it, but uh, because everything is so digital uh, and everything is so ephemeral, we no longer write letters. We no longer have photographs. Uh, we have digital files, which um, a few years from now, the format may not open the files. And so I'm actually worried how our, our uh, history of our time will be written, how it will, will be uh, preserved. And then what will be materially preserved will probably even raise uh, more questions than the um, materials from the historical periods we are studying in which writing letters or preserving receipts um, or some kind of other uh, other uh, documents was uh, was um, common uh, but now we have everything on the cloud uh, which may or may not exist there um I, I don't have much to add to the good thoughts of my colleagues here. Uh, certainly, uh, we are, especially right now in the last few years, it feels like uh, history on AMPS unfolding uh, with each day. And uh, our students are trying very hard to grasp on to you know, the pandemic. And is it World War III? And they are. Uh, we are entirely um, uh, looking at the digital uh, age now differently than just a few decades ago. In fact, uh, I, we had a, a recent conversation in one of my classes uh, about the difference between indirect and direct sources uh, and uh, found really a blending. I mean, what is a primary source? we're now uh, about to accept into courts of law, if we haven't already, uh, you know, tweets and, uh, and videos and blogs out of uh, this place and that place and uh, websites uh, in my field uh, of theater performances that were live streamed because the theaters were closed down. And so um, I, I think we have to be vigilant uh, I agree to uh, not just try to take derivative sources, uh, but to try to weigh. And I think we need multiple kinds of sources, which is why, uh, as Magda said before, uh, bringing together artifacts and really three-dimensional objects with the materiality of texts, whether they're uh, reports from uh, you know the, the Third Reich and uh, governmental ones or memoirs or letters uh, and take them together and, and, and try and probably things from the internet uh, and try to uh, really weigh and get a balance in, 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 in figuring out things. And I think it's going to take time <laughs> to do that as uh, things uh, unfold around us uh, in uh, rather surprising ways. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all three for the comments on that last and thank uh, the audience for their great questions and the three of you for your presentations, for your participation in the Shared History Project. And um, I'm already turning around thinking about um, how, what, what new questions we could ask of ourselves and, and come back and do this again, because I learned a lot. Uh, greatly appreciated and we wish everybody a, a wonderful afternoon and weekend.